Hey guys, it's Exor Sizzle. So, as promised, I am back today to talk about the plot of Fatal Frame 3. But before we can do that, let's talk about some of the victims of the Tattooed Curse. The first ghosts we ever see in the game, Makie and Kozue Kuzuhara, are possibly the oldest victims. In the early 1900s, Kozue was probably 5 to 8 years old, just chilling in Japan, playing with her ball, when it landed on the roof of her house. When her dad went up to retrieve it for her, he fell to his death. Kozue never told her mom, Makie, what had happened, probably due to guilt, but unbeknown to Kozue, her mom had already found his dead body. Makie didn't know what to tell her daughter, so she just pretended he disappeared. They searched the woods around their house every day until Kozue eventually became cursed from the survivor's guilt and probably dragged her mom into the manor. Makie could have dreamt about the manor on her own, but I like to think she followed Kozue in after Kozue dreamt about her. Either way, they both succumbed to the curse, and even now, 80-ish years later, they are still searching for their father-slash-husband. Stroller Grandma appears to also be from a few decades ago, but we pretty much know nothing about her. We don't even know for sure if she was a victim of the curse. According to her ghostless entry, she was so distraught by her grandchild's death that she dug up its body from the grave. But if you look inside her stroller, she has at least three baby souls put in there. Like an amalgamation of baby souls. What the fuck? So, is she rounding up the dead babies from that baby well I told you about? Who knows, but it would make a lot of sense at least to me. Trivia time, she's based on a weird encounter Makoto Shibata, the series co-creator, had in an abandoned house as a child. She is one of the strongest ghosts in the game and the only one who can't be pushed back by a fatal frame. During battles with her, you can hear a baby crying, Stroller Grandma herself humming the sleeping priestess lullaby. In 1962, cassette tapes were invented, so unless the tapes Ray receives from Kei are recorded from older records, Seirizawa and the unnamed manor are next oldest known victims. Seirizawa has a pretty typical story. Her mother died, and after dreaming about her a lot, she started having dreams of the manor of sleep. She followed her mother in, even though she knew she wouldn't be able to leave after the door closed behind her, and kept going deeper and deeper every night. Eventually, she was hospitalized, where her doctor decided to record their sessions together. She was driven crazy by the curse, especially when she realized the doctor thought she was just hallucinating everything. I think the unnamed man is a little more interesting, though. After his wife died, he started dreaming about her and eventually the manner of sleep. He began following her through the manor, as all victims do, and saw the same things Ray sees during hour six. All the shrine carpenters being murdered by the hatchet man, a.k.a. Tengai, a.k.a. the hash-slinging slasher. Tengai started chasing him, and he ran, but when he came to- Now I was the one chasing the man. What the fuck? Gross. Disgusting. What? He also saw the Maria Carpenters willingly killing themselves for the sake of the shrine. All this carpenter imagery leads me to believe that maybe he was a construction worker himself? Next up is Kiriko Azunuma, the crawling woman. This is yet another ghost that we don't get an exact time range for her life, but we do know that she was 23 when she died and she appears to be from more modern times based on the fact that she wears a western dress instead of kimono or yukata. Two robbers broke into her home and killed her brother and parents. Kiriko survived by hiding in the closet but became agoraphobic, unable to leave her house, and was hospitalized. She disappeared about a month later and now spends her time creeping around underneath the floorboards of the manor and hanging out in Ray's closet. Okay, we're finally ready to talk about the plot. A week after Mio and Mayu, the protagonist from the second game, go missing, Mio is found alone in the woods. She is immediately questioned about Mayu but refuses to speak about anything that happened during that week, leading locals to assume Mayu has been spirited away. At some point, either before or after the events of Fatal Frame 2, Shizu, Mio and Mayu's mother, is hospitalized, leaving the twins in the care of Shizu's brother, Kei. Kei introduces Mio to Yuazo, an anthropologist slash folklorist knowledgeable in Spirited Away cases, presumably to get more information out of her. This visit did not go well, though, as Kei apologizes to you for Mio causing trouble in his second letter. Prior to this, you had been researching the House of Sleep after reading about it in an occult magazine and connected it to the Tattooed Curse, a growing concern in the psychiatric community due to so many lost patients. From my understanding, you casually mentioned this to Kay, and Kay thought maybe it had something to do with Mayu's disappearance and asked you to continue investigating. Kay began investigating his own ideas, presumably looking around for the lost village and ended up stumbling upon an old abandoned temple near the Kuze Shrine where he found Akito's camera obscura and some of his notes on the shrine. After seeing the camera, Mio began acting even weirder and started sleeping more and more to the point where she only woke up every two days and even then only for a few hours. It goes without saying that she's cursed. The mysterious disease gets so bad that at some point Mio has to be hospitalized so that Kay can focus on his research. In July 1988, the same month as Fatal Frame 2, Yu is killed in a car crash caused by his fiancé, Ray, before he can finish his research, unbeknownst to Kay, who will not stop sending him letters. Prior to his death, Yu was also friends with Mafuyu Hinasaki, Miku from the first game's older brother, possibly due to them both being folklore researchers. When Mafuyu went missing two years prior to the start of Fatal Frame 3, Yu took Miku and eventually introducing her to his photographer fiancé, Rei Kurosawa, and Miku ends up becoming her assistant. Neither Yu nor Miku tell Rei about Mafuyu's death, although she does know that Yu and Mafuyu are best friends. On September 7th, 1988, Rei and Miku are out on an assignment to photograph the Kusei Shrine. It's unknown who gave her this assignment, though, as she is a freelance photographer, but I think the most likely answer is it was for an occult magazine. While there, Ray sees you at the end of a hallway and chases after him. 
That was her first mistake, other than killing her fiancé. She might not have even been cursed if she hadn't followed him, but how was she supposed to know? She knew nothing about the house before coming, other than that it's a place where the living and dead can meet. Research is for chumps. She falls into a monochromatic daydream where she sees various ghosts, such as Tengai, Makie, and Kozue, and an engraver. She follows you all the way back to the engraving shrine, where she first sees Reika and is immediately terrified. Reika almost hugs her, causing Rei to have a vision of herself lying in the Chamber of Thorns for her own impalement ceremony. The tattoo spreads over her body slowly as the four handmaidens begin to impale her. As soon as the tattoo reaches Rei's eyes, she wakes up and is back in the same spot she was before following you. After returning home, Rei develops the photo of you she took before her daydream and her suspicions are confirmed. You really was there. That night, she starts dreaming of the manor. I'm not entirely sure if she started dreaming about the manor because of her own guilt or if it was because she went to the actual real-life Kuze shrine and followed you inside. Personally, I think if she hadn't visited the manor, she probably wouldn't have been cursed, as it had been over a month since you died, and the rest of the victims seemed to be pretty seemed to be cursed pretty soon after the death of their loved one. Thanks to a helpful little ghost hand, Ray finds a camera obscura on the second floor of the hearth room. Who this ghost hand belongs to is up for debate, but I personally think it was either Amane or you, just because Amane is pretty much the most helpful ghost in the game, and you probably want Ray to survive. Ray learns the camera has the power to exercise ghosts after using it to defeat Maki and Kozue, the wandering mom and daughter. She also encounters another cursed victim, this time a living, breathing victim, who we later find out is named Yoshino Takigawa. While talking to Yoshino, Reika approaches and chases after Rei, just barely touching her shoulder. Rei wakes up immediately, and the iconic Snake and Holly tattoo appears. She. Is. Fucked. That day, Rei finds the camera obscura K sent to you in Yu's room, along with some old film inside, although there is no explanation for where the film comes from. She develops the film in her dark room, and it reveals a picture of Yoshino. She gives it to Miku for her to research, because Rei is too busy taking sad showers and sleeping. The first two hours or chapters of the game are just based on following Yoshino around and finding out more about her, so let's just go ahead and talk about her backstory. She was the lone survivor of a horrific plane crash that killed her fiancé and entire family. She had to lay with their dead bodies and the bodies of other victims scattered around her for four days before being rescued, so you can imagine how bad her survivor's guilt was. She was hospitalized around August 10th and had her first manner of sleep dream on the 13th. She followed the recreations of her family and fiancé deeper and deeper into the manor until eventually they were the ones following her, taunting her for surviving. When Rei meets her, she is still alive, but she won't stop saying, It's not my fault, I didn't choose to survive, over and over again. At the end of night two, as Rei is walking away from Yoshino, Yoshino says, Please, if you should wake up, help me. Rei wakes up, and as usual, the tattoo continues to spread. She heads downstairs and gets a phone call from Miku saying that she found the hospital Yoshino is staying at. Rei heads to the hospital, and Yoshino disappears into a soot-like bedstain right before her eyes. Yoshino is now a hostile ghost corrupted by the Rift and permanently trapped in the manor. The rest of hour two is pretty much just unlocking things and fighting off a few shrine carpenters. Ray finds the stained corridor where the shrine carpenters were stuffed inside the wall and is understandably concerned, especially when she finds a hand sticking out of one of the walls. If you take a picture of this and give it to Miku, she'll give you an article about bodies being found inside the walls of Kukaji Temple, which is a real place in Japan. Sadly, or not so sadly, there are supposedly no real sacrificial pillars at the temple in real life, but this is a thing that used to happen in Japan. It's called Tito Bashida, and I'll include a link to that in the page in the description below. At the end of hour two, Rei makes her way into an even bigger and older part of the manor, sees you again, and wakes up. After the usual tattoo business stops, Rei gets another phone call from Miku, only this time Yoshino can be heard in the background giving her usual spiel. As the side effect of the curse and the rift spreading, the ghosts are slowly starting to slip into the real world. Miku tells Rei that she's going to be out for a while, but she has notes on Yoshino's past on her desk. Rei reads the notes and finds a picture of an unknown man in Miku, noting that Miku has never looked that happy since. During hour three, Rei starts exploring the older part of the sleep shrine and sees handmaids Misame and Minamo several times, even fighting Minamo off in the doll altar at the end of the chapter. Minamo, who I personally believe is only five years old based on appearance, drops a very disturbing diary. Here's an excerpt. I wonder if being impaled hurts. I wonder which hurts worse, having the stake go in a little bit at a time or having it stabbed through all at once. I wonder if they die if the stake goes all the way through. I wonder if it matters if they die. After this, Rei wakes up and heads downstairs to find Miku humming the sleeping priestess lullaby. Rei recognizes the lullaby immediately and asks Miku about it. She says she's been hearing it in her dreams a lot lately, but she doesn't know where it came from. When Miku's dreams first started blending from being about Mafuyu to being about the manor, she only heard the handmaiden's song. This is most likely because of the sympathetic bond between Miku and Amane. They've both lost their brothers, and yet they're still looking for them, so they choose to help each other. The next night, Rei starts dreaming Miku's dream, similar to how the tattooed priestess would dream about other people's pain. I'm not sure if Miku starts having the dream because she visited the Kuze Shrine in the real world, or if it's because Rei started dreaming about her. I don't think it's because of her guilt about Mafuyu's death, just because it's been two years and I think she would have been cursed long, long ago. Miku is back in the Himuro Mansion, only it's a jumbled up dream version pulled from Miku's horrific memories there. Rooms that shouldn't connect do, such as the entrance area to the fish tank room, and the fish tank room to Kiriate's cell. Of course, the rope altar is also there, complete with a brand new rope shrine maiden, 
Kizuna Himuro. Maybe not brand new though, just depends on if she attached herself to Miku during her time at Himuro or she is just a figment of Miku's imagination. The only thing we know about her for sure is that her ritual is most likely a success judging by her one diary entry. After fighting off Kizuna, the seal to the door that lets Miku leave the dream is unbroken, which she obviously heads straight for. Miku's fucked up, but she's not fucked up enough to want to stick around. Just as she's about to leave, Amane appears behind her and says, Big Brother's over here! Miku mistakes Big Brother for Mafuyu instead of Kaname and follows her, discovering that the humoral part of the manor is in fact connected to the rest of it and ends up in the tattoo altar. Amane points up towards the hanging prison where Reiko was kept and asks her to save the two, presumably by preventing Yashu from killing Kaname again. Rei wakes up and checks on Miku, but she is fine for the most part. She just couldn't sleep. Rei asks about the picture on her desk, and Miku finally tells Rei that her missing family member is her brother, Mafuyu. Rei finds a fourth letter from Kei. He says that he is now having the manner of sleep dream, only he is following Mio instead of a dead loved one, something he hadn't heard of until now. He plans to continue following her and try to wake her up, although I'm not sure how he planned to do this. Perhaps he meant he was just trying to break the curse. I don't know. Either way, Rei starts dreaming Kei's dream the next night. As a man in the Kuze shrine, Kei is chased by multiple women, including Reika, Kyoka, and Yashu. Reika just wants to curse him, Hyoka thinks he's Akito because they look almost identical, and Yashu just hates men in general. He finds Akito's camera in a drawer of Akito's belongings that was apparently heavily guarded by Yashu to keep Kyoka from discovering Akito's fate. This only makes Kyoka even more convinced Kei is Akito, of course, and she doesn't stop berating him for leaving her for the rest of the game. At the beginning of Kei's dream, Kei sees a very small glimpse of Mio going through a door surrounded by crimson butterflies that is locked once he gets to it, and makes it his mission to find the key. Oddly enough, he finds the key in the library above Yashu's room, the altar where the commandment home is supposed to be. He takes the key back to the mysterious door, and lo and behold, we are in the Kurosawa house holding cell from the second game, or the room outside of it. Mio is locked in the cell, ignoring Kei like the little 15-year-old she is. After Kei calls out to Mio, Rei wakes up to a strange static-like sound coming from the attic above Yu's room, but when she goes up to investigate, the sound stops and nothing is there. Just as she's about to leave, Kiriko, the crawling woman, slinks out on all fours and grabs Rei, causing her to wake up yet again. Rei, being the boss-ass bitch she is, goes back to the attic and finds another one of Dr. Azo's inventions, the Spirit Stone Radio. The next night, Rei goes around trying to break the seals of the shrine courtyard and even further beyond that, the engraving shrine. She follows bloodstains on the floor around the manor, fighting off various shrine carpenters and their killers, the Maria family carpenters who make up 80% of the seal on the door. The other 20% of the seal is Tengai Narumi, the head carpenter, and when Rei comes back to the door to check the seal at the end of the chapter, Tengai warns her not to open the door. We find out later on this because they did manage to trap the miasma in the rift shrine. Although it did not stop the unleashing or prevent the rift from spreading, it did make it harder for Reika to wander, possibly because she can't see as well without large amounts of miasma around her. Rei wakes up in the middle of the night to her phone ringing. When she answers it, it's Kiriko yet again saying, Let me out! And I should have died. Afterwards, Rei goes to develop some photos and finds Yoshino walking down her hallway and Kiriko chilling in her red room. Nice. Rei goes back to sleep and starts dreaming Miku's dream again. Miku is in the tattoo altar, right where we left her in hour 4. Amane once again asks her to save the two. Miku decides the way to do it is to find a way into the hanging prison, so she sets off to find the four purity stones. The purity stones were guarded by the four handmaidens, and when put in the order of the sleeping priestess lullaby, they would raise the hanging prison so the priestess and her handmaiden caretaker could get in and out of the cage. Miku has to crawl around underneath the floorboards in first person to access the various doll altars, making this hour one of the creepiest in the entire game, in my opinion. She eventually gathers up all the purity stones and raises the cage, but Yashu attacks her, causing Rei to wake up. Oddly enough, it is still nighttime. This is the second night in a row where we don't get to wake up to the cloudy, rainy sunlight, and it's pretty unsettling. This is unconfirmed as we only have a very small handful of dates for the Fatal Frame 3 timeline, but I think that this is the part of the game where Rei and her pals begin sleeping for multiple days at a time. Rei checks on Miku and she seems to be in a mini trance, at first only muttering, Mafuyu. When Rei calls out to her, she says she just had another nightmare. That morning, Miku gives Rei some of Akito's research notes on the lullaby. I have absolutely zero idea how she got these, but here are two possibilities. She could have been snooping around and used belongings or the stuff Kay sent, or she could have found them while at the shrine, although I don't think she would want to take home souvenirs. If you have other ideas about how she could have gotten these notes, please let me know. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, the notes just go over the history of the song in different versions from the different mountains and various interpretations. The next night is Kay's night. He must find the shadow and light key so he can open the door to the Kurosawa house holding cell where Mio is sitting in a catatonic state. He is led around the Minakami area by Suzuri and Musubi Osaka, twins that successfully participated in the Crimson Sacrifice ritual in Minakami Village. They attached themselves to Mio somehow during her time there and then made their way to the manor of sleep. After getting the keys, Kay is trapped in the Great Hall by a brand new and somehow even more terrifying Kusabi. Thankfully, a mysterious crimson butterfly shows up and breaks the seal on the door, leading back to the holding cell so Kay can escape. I like to think this butterfly is Mayu, just because maybe that would mean she's been purified by the abyss and is no longer possessed by Sai, but I think it's just as likely to be any old crimson butterfly. 
When Kay finally makes it back to the cell, Mia was gone, but she's left him a pinwheel key. So that's cool, I guess. Thanks. The supposedly friendly Crimson Butterfly leads him down a very long, familiar, winding hallway to the rope altar where he is attacked by the Kusabi. Kay manages to fight him off and leave the Minakami area, at which point Ray wakes up. The phone is ringing, so Ray goes downstairs, and guess who it is? It's Kay. He asks if this is the home of Mr. Azo, and Ray says it is, but he died a few months ago. Kay expresses his condolences and says they were doing an investigation together, but they lost contact. Ray tells him that she knows about that investigation and she wants Kay to continue. Kay warily asks why, presumably not wanting to spread the curse, and Ray says she can't say, but please do it. Kay then asks if he can come and pay his respects in person soon, and Ray agrees. When Ray goes to bed that night, she finds herself in the hanging prison with everything around her in monochrome, similar to her daydream at the beginning of the game. She makes her way through the manor, being greeted by bowing handmaidens along the way. Once she makes it to the almost unsealed door to the rift shrine and tries to open it, the daydream ends and Tengai attacks her. After the fight, Ray follows Tengai's vanishing ghost to the enclosed room where he killed himself. By taking a picture of his ghostly dead body, Ray finally breaks the seal to the rift shrine, undoing all of everyone's hard work. Thanks a lot, Ray. She goes back to the spirit tree courtyard and opens the door. Two engravers are standing outside of the engraving shrine, revealing that Ray was actually on her way to get tattooed at the beginning of the hour. As she approaches them, she wakes up. The tattoo is now spreading all the way down to Ray's calves and almost her ankles, so she has to hurry the fuck up or she will never wake up again. The phone is ringing yet again, only this time it's Kiriko still begging to be let out. Ray hangs up and almost immediately after, Kay calls. He asks if Ray had the dream again and she says yes. Kay thinks they should go back to the real world Kuze shrine and see what they can find and compare their notes on the house and curse. Ray somewhat agrees but is a little hesitant. That night, the scariest thing in the entirety of the series, at least for me, happens. Watch this. Somehow, Ray manages to go to sleep and dreams Kay's dream. Kay opens the doors to the shrine courtyard, the doors Ray just broke the seals to, and releases all the miasma inside. From this point on, the player must pick up purifying light candles to briefly dispel the miasma, or Reiko will follow them from room to room. As Kay approaches the engraving shrine, he sees Kaname on the roof of the shrine. After checking the door, Kay, being the big manly man he is, decides to follow him by jumping from the roof of the book storeroom to the roof of the engraving shrine. What the fuck, Kay? While in the storeroom, he finds notes on the various rituals performed at the shrine, the unleashing and the mirror of loss. Kay finds his way into the engraving shrine and watches from above as Reika is tattooed by her two engraver pals. After they disappear, Kay descends and tries to find a way deeper into the shrine because he thinks it'll help for some reason. You'd think he would just chill in an outside part of the manor until he woke up with how anti-men these ghosts are, but he and Mio are about to die, so he's pretty desperate to find a way out. Sadly, there are super strong screens blocking the door to the last passage, so Kay leaves to try to find the key, the mirror of loss. Ray wants to be the star of this show, though, so she wakes up. The next day is pretty uneventful. Ray just develops the photo of Amane Kay took, revealing she was holding the commandment tome. I've been going back and forth on why she has the commandment tome, but I think the most likely theory is just because it's the key to the hanging prison and her job was to care for Reika. I wonder if she was allowed to read it or not, though, just because when Kay approaches her for the picture, she's hiding it away and crying. Maybe this was the point where she actually realized she really did have to impale her best friend. Or it's just a hint to pick it up the next night. We are now at hour 11, dreaming Miku's dream. Once Miku gets the commandment tome, she unlocks the door in the flickering hallway and grabs the mirror of loss from inside the hanging prison. The item Amane wanted her to get seven chapters ago. Miku uses the mirror to unlock the door to the abyss, the large spiral staircase behind the engraving shrine, and descends. She learns about her good friend Amane's fate and is understandably pretty upset, leading her to believe she too must be punished for her evil deeds. When Miku enters the last passage, she sees Konami, but the camera shows Mafuyu. I think this is because Rei is also watching Miku's dream, so maybe Rei sees Konami, but Miku sees Mafuyu? Or it's to create a connection between Konami's relation to Reika and Mafuyu's relation to Miku, foreshadowing the events of Fatal Frame 5. I don't want to say too much about that right now, but I will get there. I promise. Miku calls out to him, saying, I want to be where you are! Rei wakes up and checks on Miku, who is now covered in tattoos. Miku finally opens up about her time at Himuro and the guilt she feels for leaving Mafuyu, the only one who ever understood her behind. She talks about how she's beginning to lose her memories of Mafuyu, a side effect of the curse, and that's why she wants to follow him. She feels like it doesn't matter if she forgets him or not, no matter what, she can't go on without him, so she just wants to be with him again. Ray tells her she's not alone and they'll get through this together, but it's no use. Not even Ray believes it. Ray reluctantly falls back asleep and sees Miku back at the entrance to Himuro Mansion. Miku tries to leave for obvious reasons, but the door is locked, so probably thinking that Kizuna had something to do with it, Miku heads to the rope altar and fights her ghost off one more time. As she's about to leave, Miku senses Mafuyu behind her, heading deeper into the manor. She can either choose to return to the manor of sleep and try to find another way to break the curse, or she can turn around and follow Mafuyu. If you head back to the manor of sleep, Reika will attack Miku in the rope hallway, causing Rei to wake up. I don't think this is canon, just because it's way too simple for Fatal Frame. If you choose to follow Mafuyu, Miku will open the previously locked doors, revealing it's yet another part of the Himuro Mansion, the hallway leading to the Demon Mouth. 
Miku sees Mafuyu at the end of the hallway and runs, calling out to him. He turns around but says absolutely nothing. He just gives her a kind of sad, kind of pissed off look. I think this is because this isn't actually the real Mafuyu. It's a manifestation of Mafuyu designed by the Manor of Sleep to draw Miku in further by making her feel like she did the wrong thing and Mafuyu was mad at her for it. The same exact thing happened to Yoshino earlier in the game. After the staring contest, Mafuyu continues walking away and Miku thinks for a few seconds. She decides to continue following him, separating herself from Rei. Rei begs her to stop and even points out that it's not him, he's dead, but Miku won't listen. She runs off into the distance and then fades away. Personal theory time! After Miku runs off, I believe that she feels like she's running down the same hallway over and over again. It never ends and eventually she starts running from Mafuyu's evil clone. Evil Mafuyu follows her around the manor and taunts her, telling her she should have stayed with him at Himuro even after it collapsed. She should have died that day. It's all her fault Mafuyu's dead. You know, all the fun stuff she thought Mafuyu would only say at her worst nightmares. Rei jumps up and runs into Miku's room, ignoring the excruciating pain of the tattoo spreading across her body. The door is cracked just enough for Rei to see five engravers standing around her bed. The fact that there are five engravers is super weird to me, as engravers were a pair deal, but I think it's a callback to the Himuro family head and his four priests who were each in charge of a different body part in the strangling ritual from the first game. Or maybe only two are actual engravers and the three others are the people she has supposedly wronged, like Mafuyu and her mother. In my opinion, the most likely theory is that the two seen in almost full detail are engravers. One is Yashu, and the other two are two of the handmaidens. The other two are behind the door chilling. I think it's the most likely theory just because Miku's tattoos are probably done growing, so she's ready to be impaled now. She's heading down to the Chamber of Thorns as Rei looks on. After the figures disappear, Rei pulls a chair up to Miku's bed and waits for her to hopefully wake up. Kei has excellent timing and decided to come today of all days, so Rei takes him upstairs and shows Miku's sleeping body without saying a word. He asks how long it's been since she last woke up and Rei just shakes her head. She slowly walks over to him and lays her head on his shoulder, one of the sweetest moments in the game. Rei's a widow and it would probably be hard for any widow to touch another person after their loved one's death and from my understanding as a white American, Japanese people aren't as affectionate as Westerners are so it's especially sweet. They head downstairs to compare notes in the manor and Kei pulls out the real commandment tome. After the Kuze Shrine was abandoned, thieves ransacked the place for valuables and one donated the commandment tome to a nearby now also abandoned temple probably because it's a very disturbing book. Not only does it say everything a tattooed priestess must go through, it also has a list of worshippers and donation amounts written in blood. Blood. It also supposedly helped keep track of the time between each priestess, but that's only Kei's speculation. We never actually found out how he came to that conclusion. Kei also pulls out the second Legend of Song, another book he found that just goes over the interpretations of the lullaby. Since both books mention impaling the priestess to subdue her for eternity, Kay concludes he must gather up the tattooed stakes and impale her himself, which is exactly what he does. He's a man of his word. He goes around to all four doll altars to get the stakes and then heads back to the engraving shrine and down to the abyss where he fights Yashu off one more time. Inside of the Chamber of Thorns, Kay finds dozens of sleeping priestesses staked to the walls and floors and finds Reika laying in the middle of them all. As he approaches, he realizes that Reika's limbs have already been staked down. There's nothing he can do. He tries to run, but the door slams shut before he can, trapping him inside with Reika. In the first ending, Rei wakes up and finds Kei has disappeared, leaving the iconic soot-like black stain in his place. Rejoice, Kei lovers, though, as this ending is not canon. Canonically, either in hour 10 or hour 12, Kei goes to the enclosed room above the hearth room where Kyoka was kept after the unleashing and fights her off. She drops her holly key, the key to her mirror stand where she kept a picture of Akito and the earring Akito gave her. If Kei grabs these items and takes them with him to the Chamber of Thorns, Reika will spare him. As far as I know, the game never explains why she spares him, but it's presumably because seeing the earring reminds her of Konami and calms her down. Or if you don't have to be wearing the earring to express your thoughts, just holding it, then maybe it's because she can feel like Kei just wants to help her. Both answers seem perfectly plausible to me. When Rei wakes up this time, Kei is still asleep, but he's in the same comatose state as Miku. Rei checks his bag with the little snoop she is and finds out that he had been trying to figure out what the third verse of the Handmaiden's song meant. He initially thought go to the other side meant to sleep, but then decided it meant to send the priestess off in a boat because some old maps show a huge sea-like area behind the shrine. Kei had the right way to break the curse all along. God fucking damn it. Rei takes her final sad shower, at least for a little while, and goes to bed. She follows the sound of Reika's voice throughout the manor and picks up all five pieces of the Mirror of Lost so that she can use it to open the door of the abyss and then head down to the Chamber of Thorns. Once inside the chamber, Rei sees everything that happened before the unleashing and realizes what she has to do. She exercises Reika's spirit and then puts Reika and Konami's bodies into a boat and pushes the boat out into the water so their spirits can pass on. This causes all the spirits trapped within the manor to move on as well as use spirit. Rei sees his ghost one last time and calls out to him, her tattoos spreading. She tells him he's the only reason she survived this long and she's coming with him, but he tells her that as long as she goes on living, a part of him will live on too. They have one final embrace and Yu takes Rei's tattoos with him to the other side. Although we don't see it, the real Mafuyu, not the creepy judgmental ghost Mafuyu, absorbs Miku's tattoos as well. This is found out through the official Fatal Frame 5 guidebook. I have no fucking idea who absorbed Kei's tattoos. Maybe the Echo Stone Earring let him transfer his pain to Reika? 
or it could have been Kyoka, but I kind of doubt that because I think after the curse is lifted, the spirits are no longer tainted by the Rift, and they are a thousand times less crazy. It could have also been Mayu, but I'm pretty sure her soul merged with Mio, so that's not really possible. Let me know what you think about this, please. After the spirits disappear into the horizon, Rei wakes up. It's no longer raining, the sun is shining, and the tattoo is gone, but Rei begins to cry. I can't even begin to imagine how Rei feels here, but I believe the tattoos represented the punishment for killing you, and now that they're gone, it's like he's forgiven her, but Rei doesn't really want to be forgiven. She still doesn't forgive herself. Let me know if you have any other ideas for why Rei starts crying, please. I love getting into these characters' heads. Canonically, after the credits, we see a bunch of photos. The first is Miku waking up and Rei hugging her. The second is Kei waking up on the couch downstairs. The third is Rei and Miku developing photos in the red room. The fourth is Kei and Mio sitting on a bench overlooking the Minakami Dam, and the fifth is Kei introducing Mio to Rei and Miku. In the first ending, the not real one, Rei and Miku are shown sitting on a bench together. Miku says, I never understood why we survived, but now I realize why we were allowed to live. Rei agrees, saying, I'll go on living, even with the pain. Looking back 11 years later, this ending is particularly interesting even though it isn't canon just because there is an orange sunset, possibly predicting Fatal Frame 5 in Miku's return. And that's where we're going to leave this video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe so you can see my explanation of Fatal Frame 4, the most confusing game ever created. Wish me luck, it's going to take forever, but it will be worth it. I'll probably also be doing a video about Fatal Frame 3 trivia, but that won't be until after I finish explaining the other games. Thank you for your time, and have a great day.